You are tuned into the Power Chord Hour right here on 107.9 WRFA and on the Power Chord Hour podcast. However, you're listening to this, watching us, whatever you're doing, thanks for tuning in. Very happy uh, about this one. We got another episode for you today. I'm talking to Craig Northey of the band Odds, who just put out a, a new record about, I guess, a little over a month ago now, uh, Crash the Time Machine, out now everywhere, and uh, really been enjoying it. It's a, It's a, like... It's a good summer record, but it's also kind of, I was thinking this right before I got on with you, Craig, like kind of also a good end of summer into autumn, if that makes any sense. I'm very much into like albums that work for certain seasons. And this one kind of is like a good end of summer, beginning of fall, perfect time for it, perfect time to talk about the record. So Craig, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you, Anthony. I, I feel like maybe you're right. Maybe because I think with all our records, you can always find the sadness. So if it's the end of summer, just look for it. it. Has the has the bright, sparkly melodies, and then uh, the sadness is in there somewhere. I I, I honestly think that is one hundred percent why it works that way. Like the music, it's kind of, it, it's nice, good for summertime. But there is there's that like melancholy, a little melancholy in there, a little bit like yeah, <laughs> something's coming to an end. A little nostalgia on this one. I feel like a little reminiscing things like that. So yeah, kind of a uh, kind of perfect time. But like I like I said, the record's been out now for a little over a month. How's it feel to uh, have a new Odds record out into the world? How's it been so far? Uh, that's always a good feeling. I, I think the potential energy of it, and uh, that it can make you new friends, and uh, you're that you you got rid of that music in a way. You got it out of your system, and now you get to play it for the next however long you're alive. <laughs> <laughs> Going going back to like the beginning of this record, like before you know recording and all that, like where were the beginnings? Like how far back was like? Did you start going? Okay, time to write time to write another odds record. Like how how far back to the beginning of this one kind of begin for you? I think that since uh, well, I guess we call it Universal Remote, the last album, which was a collection of EPs that were always intended to be kind of a double album, and uh, we're later released as an album um since then you just keep going you keep writing things as they come to you and pieces of things happen and at some point you take stock and you say do we have enough to put out something here and i think uh that happened uh just prior to covid we got together for for a couple days of figuring that out what do we have here? How many of these are real songs? What needs to be done to flush it out? And we all played together and um, started recording on ideas we had. And uh, then COVID hit. And we had this big block of stuff, more than an album, and started to chip away at it in remote locations until it was done. So I would say that that would make it five or six years in the making really wow you know been a because, while. yeah yeah i think it i think that's uh that's what it would make it you know covid kind of extended everybody's creative period but a lot of things came out for people you know they had a chance to finish things off i'm always i'm always interested i mean obviously i'm sure a lot of people listening to this are well aware i mean odds have been around for quite a while i mean this is far from your first record i'm always interested in like a band who's been at it for for quite a while like when you go in and you write a new record i mean do you have are in your head i mean are you thinking of the back catalog the like quote unquote sound of the band like what people you know would expect from an odds record do you try not to let that stuff come into your head when you're writing a new one i'm always interested in that because like you know again no matter the band, when you're on, you know, if you have like eight, nine records, however many you have under your belt, like, I mean, you know, again, you may have some kind of defined sound or something you think might pe people might expect. I mean, do those things creep in your head this far in when you're writing a new odds record? Or do you not think about that? You just try going in with like a totally fresh slate, not kind of, you know, thinking about past albums or, you know, again, like the expect expectations of the sound of odds or anything like that. I guess the answer to the question would be yes and no. I think you are who you are. Your voice is at this point the sound of your voice and we're a vocal group as you'd think, you know, we all are singing and your your voice on your instrument is probably the same, 
but all the time you're you're learning and all the time you're trying to try different things and break patterns in what you do so every um album isn't really a reaction to the past it's more like well you you're just like most people you don't want to repeat yourself you're moving on you you've read that book so you want to read another book and watch a different movie so you you just keep learning and that changes who you are so i think five six years like you said might be enough to show some difference and i think this time each time i think we make a record we we come up with some new little rule you know a, a lot of times the, the the fun one that we've had for for a long time because we've been together 36 years or something like that is uh that sounds good what can we leave out and uh it's it's sort of like it forces you to use a a more economical approach and and maybe therefore defines the idea a little better distills what you're doing down and um a lot of times in this case there's there's some new things on this record and I don't know if they're conscious or not, but say, say, um, there's a song, the second song, I think, called Unlikely Savior, where there are no guitars on it. And we're a guitars, bass, and drums band. And um, that was because Doug Elliott, the, our bass player and perhaps the leader of our, our youth combo, um, is always experimenting with electronic stuff and always just on his laptop on a plane or in a van or whatever or in a hotel room fooling around and creating these pieces and it became the the genesis of a song and we thought let's not add too much i guess that's our credo let's not add too much of all the other jazz let's add what the song requires or what the melody requires or what the lyric requires and so interesting interesting things like that happen kind of kind of going off that I, i'm wondering like because some musicians i feel like and and i in a, in a way i feel like maybe you answered it by like kind of trying to cut things back and keeping things simple but i think i feel like some people like their first idea is their best they they kind of keep with that they don't try tooling around with it too much but then others i mean you, you have that initial idea but you start hearing other things in your head and you go oh, that would sound great in this song or like throwing this in there, this in there. I mean, does that happen with you? Is there a lot of like, you know, you might start off with, you know, the bare bones foundation of a song, but my God, in your head, you're hearing this over here and you're you're hearing all these all these little things. I mean, is it is it hard to kind of stop yourself from expanding on songs more and more? It kind of, I feel like it sounds like that with like you're talking about kind of reining it in and kind of less is more in a way. I mean, is that, is that would you agree with that? It kind of, kind of you know, like- I I think exactly we but we have four of us so we have three other people whoever it's idea it is to sh shoot it down or to augment it or to uh complement it um so there's kind of a process there's a process of collaboration helps with that rather than hinders it and and that's how it becomes distilled down because if you're all on the same page that you want the ideas to be clear you want the message or the groove of it to to dominate or maybe you do want to add so much uh sonic layers that it creates a certain feeling you know we all talk about it and and you can hear on this record that the core of the the melody or the pocket is always pretty clear but we'll go off on an, uh, an orchestral exploration for a little while to give the listener a sense of some kind of change and and back to where we were or i think um that in answer to the question i think i think i'm answering the question <laughs> you are, uh, you in, are. In, in answer to it i think that that kind of stuff is naturally dealt with by collaboration with the other guys in the band I, I'm kind of like the the other side of that, you know, I mean, that that's kind of like on the songwriting side, as far as like studio, like, you know, recording and, and that whole side of things. I mean, because it's another side where you can sit there and fine tune things as much as you want. I mean, how are you on the studio side? You like that part where you can sit and 
EQ a snare drum for two days until you get the perfect sound, fine tuning everything, adding, you know, again, like even adding these little layers going, oh, wow, like, you know, throw this little, this little lick or something here. Like, do you enjoy that side of things? Are you more of the musician who, you know, we, we practice these songs, we get them ready, we know what they're going to sound like, we go in the studio and we knock them out so we can go out and play them. You know, I feel like, I feel like musicians kind of sit in two worlds there. I mean, do you enjoy that side of things, the recording and really just fine tuning and playing around? For, you know a while um sometimes the answer is is the answer once again i'm giving you two answers that's sometimes, fine sometimes i do depending on what the song is and i think some songs are better as a description of the four people in the room where you're at at that time and to sit and play them live gives them a life and when the listener is listening they are there they're with you to create music that way, uh, everything happens kind of up front. You establish the sonic reality with great engineering and 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 an attention to detail and capturing the room, etc. That has a beauty all of its own. And some songs are a hybrid of that, where everybody plays and then you augment it. You know, I think a lot of the music from the late '60s, where people were experimenting with the studio. And then moving into the next decades, people could isolate elements a lot more and build these collages. And that is fun. And if you're doing it by yourself, sitting there a lot, sometimes you're doing that. It is fun. It also becomes dangerous because you can put a hundred thousand layers on and say, hey, we'll work it all out later. I think as long as you're making decisions, um along the way and saying yeah i don't want that and i do want this then you're you're left with something that's easier to deal with because you can drive yourself crazy um having fun with things i i like both kinds of approaches and and i think they're both on this album um both kinds of things you know we often most of the core elements were performed live as a band so that's preserved and that idea that i was speaking of of you are there sometimes it was the first time we ever got through an arrangement like um uh pat and i a bunch of these songs pat the drummer steward a, a few days we were sitting there by ourselves just coming up with ideas and saying well what would that riff and this riff together and this this chord changes sound like together and let's just try to make it sound like a song without us singing on it and play it together with the drums and the guitar right now we'll just say okay that would go here 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 and we go okay i got it and we play it and we go well, that seemed exciting and that's it and that's the basis of everything else that was piled on around it by the other two guys and um we get together in the studio and they'd listen and go well we can't beat that let's put stuff on that so there it happened in any number of those ways you know so that's fun you know we're we're having fun trying to figure out what the heart of this is what the excitement level is what the does that have a vibe that makes sense that makes sense and that and you're right i feel like that side's kind of fun like that mm -hmm. side's and it's kind of natural too. I I feel like like that probably just comes out of. I mean, if you get two people in a room and you start playing together, that that side of it is. I mean, you know, you have your initial ideas, but it seems almost impossible. Where if you get in the room and you don't have any ideas, you can't build off of that. That almost seems yeah. like a problem. Like if you both sat yeah. in that room for two days and nothing extra came out of it, like that that also seems like that might not be good. Yeah, I think I think that's where like some songs on this record were tossed out somewhere along the process. And then somebody came back and said they were driving around in their car, listening to the tracks so far and saying, why are we tossing that out again? There's this thing that about it that I really love. And then we talk about the things about it that we didn't love again. And we'd go, well, who's going to work on the parts that we don't love? and get back to us with it because then maybe it can work and those songs came back oh, wow now actually that that kind of goes off something i'm always interested in in too like for you 
you know, like with songs, I mean, some musicians, you start writing it and if the song doesn't work, like, you know, within a couple, you know, in a month or something, you, you just throw it away. Other people will preserve something. Maybe it's not working now. I'll play with it in three years. I mean, do you gen- generally speaking, I'm sure that changes up, but do you have a certain amount of time you would say where you give a song some love before you go, okay, this just absolutely isn't working. Or will you do that? Will you kind of salvage songs and be like, Hey, maybe you pick out from an idea you had five years ago. Maybe it didn't work then, but it works now. I don't go back too much to the scrap heap, you know, although there, there's, there's after all this time, there's so much on the scrap heap and there's usually something good about it or you wouldn't have gone more than f- five minutes down that road. It's a good point. But so there's usually something good, but um, I think, I can't remember who told me that, that ideas are infinite. <laughs> so you just kind of go, well, there'll be another one down the road that'll somehow be related to that, but have solved the problem because today's a new day. That makes sense. How about, uh, you know, for cra- you're talking about recording Crash the Time Machine, where was it recorded? Where where did you guys record this album? We have a studio in, in uh, North Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, yeah, it's it, that's where we did it. We do. We've done everything since uh, two thousand. Uh, I'm going to say two thousand one. Like wow. the last last twenty years, we've done almost everything there. So sometimes we've done things in another studio, but uh, mostly it's all been there. Did was this one uh, self produced, self recorded, or did you have a producer with this one? Uh, well, yeah, we had ourselves and then about a third of the way through as the songs were kind of coming together, um, we brought on Stephen Page as a co-producer with us. Um, Stephen's a decades old friend and collaborator. I, I've made um, quite a lot of music with Stephen since he left Bare Naked Ladies and play in his trio. Um, and odds have played on his records and, uh, in the last, his solo records. So we just sort of thought this is natural. He understands us. He understands our process. He's worked with us, recorded with us, and we've been friends and fans of each other's music for so long that he's, he's able to say, which a, a lot of collaboration is, if it's a positive thing is not. I don't really like that idea. It's more or less, you know, that part you just played there, that was really good. Just that part. So let's start there. It's more about being able to pick out what's good about something. And so we brought him in as the other voice. Uh, You know, when, when we didn't know, we just email Steven uh, an attachment of the song and say, this is where it's at now. What do you think? And he typed back a, you know, a bunch of bullet points and they were always really great and a really good oh i didn't think of that when it when it comes to producers over the years like you were kind of talking about there, like working with steven i mean like is it is it easier then to kind of take direction would you say from a somebody who you know and you kind of have you know obviously you've worked with you know them and all that versus going in with someone who maybe you really have never met before those sessions. And now you're kind of taking, obviously it's their job, but you're still taking, I don't know if I want to say command, but you are, you know, is it easier to take some of those things or ideas from somebody who you already kind of have that foundation with versus going in with a producer who, you know, again, you may not know them or you may know their work, but you don't personally know them. I, I don't know. I generally have worked with people I know for the last, for the last long time and only was in that situation. Um, I've been in that situation quite a bit as a sideman on other people's records where there's a producer that they've hired or they work with that I didn't really know very well, but you can, you can build a respect really quickly, especially if they got hired to produce somebody's record, they probably know something. And, uh, Um, I don't find it that hard. I mean, everyone has their own idea that they quietly hide if they're, they don't have a voice in the situation, but we have a voice and we're, we'd be terrible to produce because we're, 
we've been at this so long that, and we all have a very uh, instant and specific um, idea about what should happen and are very, we're quite unified. So if we didn't agree with the producer that we brought in, we would probably just destroy them and move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, at this point you probably know, I mean, I, I feel like doing this after a couple of decades, you figure out the way you like to record the best mm -hmm. way, you, you know, whether working with a producer, self-producing, like the best mm -hmm. way all that works. I imagine you learned that about yourself along the way somewhere. Yeah. I think, I think it would be fun to do if we went, Hey, we want to redefine ourselves. So we're going to pick a different voice from a, a different thing that we respect. We really love their music and the music they've made with others. It would be fun to go into there and, and have to reassess all the time and get past how you feel about that to break the patterns. I would like to do it, but I think we kind of trust each other to do that for each other. So um, we haven't found it necessary. I suppose. Yeah. I mean, again, there, I feel like there's no real need. I mean, a new band, if you're really trying to still find the sound of odds or what odds should sound like, that might help. But I don't know how much help you need at this point to figuring out the sound of the band. I don't I don't think that's an issue anymore. Yeah, I think we got comfortable with uh, not comfortable, which is probably a dangerous word. But we've we understand what it is we do naturally, the point where we meet. And I think when we were young, in our early 20s, when we met and we started making music together, we thought that we were wildly dissimilar. We thought each person, you know, two guys were really into Miles Davis. Uh, one guy was really, and I was really into early soul music at the time and still am. And, and um, you know, we had these different perspectives on what our passions were but we just talked about it a lot and found that hey we all like the beatles we all like xtc we all like certain things like there's a crossing over point and somehow when all our things came together and we played we became this this other thing you know we we just realized there were crossing over points and and uh, discussions uh, could get heated, but we we realized there was a thing that happened when we played together, and now and we grew comfortable with that idea. So now we don't really think too much about it. We know that we'll sound like odds no matter what we do, but it, things that we think are wildly different, other people go, oh no, they just sound exactly like themselves. <laughs> <laughs> we we think we think we've radically changed and no everyone else goes it they're back they sound just like they did, <laughs> they did. you know kind of kind of going off that like you know the the early i know we keep talking about like you know the sound having it in your head and all things like that like the very beginning of odds when you're when you're getting together and all you guys are playing i mean did you kind of have you know i don't know i use the word vision but did you kind of have a vision of what odds sounded like before you guys even kind of really started playing? Did you kind of know what it was going to be? Or is that one of those things where it just truly kind of gets bashed out as, you know, you all get in a room and play together. I mean, how, how thought out before really even playing, did you kind of know what odds was going to sound like if at all? Not at all. I mean, I, I think we came together because we liked each other and we liked, um, we saw that musician around town or ran into them, you know, whoever else um, was in the band. There, there were two different members at the very beginning of the band for the first 10 years. Um, but when we saw each other around town, we went, fuck, sorry, I can't swear, can I? Oh, no, you, can, you can, can, I can edit it. Okay, there you go. All the F-bombs you want. We, we said, oh my, I really dig that guys playing and his vibe and and uh um what he's doing and and the band they were in might be quite dissimilar to yours but we were all kind of the weirdos from the bands that we were in and we all ended up together because i think we all really they found something really interesting about what the other person was doing and um sort of recruited each other simultaneously 
and ended up in a room. And on the first day that we, they coaxed me into, I remember I was the last to join. They coaxed me into it. I didn't want to be in a band at the time. <laughs> and, uh, but I said, okay, I'll come over and play with you guys. And this Paul Brennan and Stephen Drake and Doug Elliott. And Paul was my connection to it, the drummer. He was 18 at the time. And, uh, and he said, come on over, just, just play with us, see what happens. So I just walked into a basement with three other guys and that I respected. And we started playing. And that afternoon, we wrote about four or five of the songs that would later come out on the first records. You know, Jeez. so we went, oh, I guess there is something here. And I went home. I said, I'll think about it. <laughs> I went home and about two weeks later, I said, yeah, what I'd be stupid not to do this. So that's still even that it's still even after writing those in that first in that first kind of meeting and session, you still have to kind of think about it for a couple of days. Well, if you've ever been in a band, it's not easy. So I, I'd sort of come out of that and thought, oh, maybe I'll be like my other heroes, like Warren Zevon or somebody that you know. Speaking of it, it's, it's part of our later history. Um, and hire people, you know, I'll just do it my way. But uh, then I realized, no, 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 this is a bands are bands are a valuable thing. If you can find that chemistry, there's nothing like it. It sounds I mean, it sounds like you were writing right away. I mean, did you start playing? Did odd start playing shows and all that? Like, pretty, uh, pretty right from the get go? Or are you just out there like, hitting and doing it all right away? It's I mean, it sounds like it got going right from the first uh, from the first time you got in the room writing songs. It sounds like things are moving fairly fast. Yeah, I think we got together in the late summer. Uh, segue to your you know, late summer. We got together <laughs> in the late late summer, and uh, and we did our first gig in November. Um, and because we wanted to write everything and and have a full evening of material, so we. We wrote it all and then we had our first gig and had a name and all that kind of stuff. Did our first gig in November of that year of 1987. And uh, so it came around pretty fast. And then there were so many elaborate ways of getting our music noticed that it took years after that. It took till 19. We made a couple cassette only, as it was in those days, albums and sold them from the stage. and. Uh, then our actual first release to lots of people through a big label was in uh, 1991. Oh, wow. So, yeah, there's a, there's a little time in between there. Oh, and so many elaborate schemes and lots, lots and lots of playing nightly. Did you, uh, I mean, did you, because, I mean, being from Vancouver, I guess I assume you would hit the States fairly, or at least like Washington and stuff. I mean, did you did you get down here? And it's kind of interesting too, because obviously the band's been around for a long time. I discovered odds like a year ago. So some of this stuff's still mm -hmm. kind of like learning about it. You know, I mean, did you play the states much back then or even throughout the years? I mean, did you did you make it to the states? Was it easy to get over here? Because sometimes I talk to musicians and it's something I never think of, but going, you know, as close as it is, I live two hours from the Canadian border. So like to me, I'm like, ah, oh, it just makes sense. But Breaking in from one country to the other sometimes sounds like it's harder than it seems. I mean, what was that like for you guys? Yes, uh, all all the answers. What what was it like? <laughs> it was very different than it is for musicians now. In that, um, we were kind of sending our music out to uh, back then. The whole landscape was different in terms of labels and how things worked. There wasn't Spotify or streaming or access or YouTube access to the channels that would get your music heard that there there are now back then there were gatekeepers and you had to get funding and support from those gatekeepers which were these big labels or smaller labels somebody somebody had to help you and uh in canada we weren't getting much reaction i guess we were just a little too weird or not timely not sounding like what was on the radio so um we were seen by <clears throat> we had a house gig i'll try to make this short we had a house gig on this the sort of entertainment strip that was just 
beginning in Vancouver, and it was a, a shtick. We were a phony British invasion band with uh, disguises and glasses, and we would play four sets a night and change the words and kind of insult the audience, and it was kind of a shtick. And um, we used that to go downstairs in the basement of this club and record our own stuff. And every Thursday we would open for ourselves, but without the wigs and the glasses and stuff. And um, we used the money from that to fly to Los Angeles and play showcases and house gigs and things there because we weren't getting much reaction, but we'd had a couple people come up from Los Angeles and walk into this club and go, what the hell, what are you guys doing? Who are you? Well, if you're ever down there, come visit me. So we started doing that and we would pack our stuff in a box and send it to a friend and uh, go to the border and say, yeah, we're going to Disneyland again. <laughs> you know, it, it was it was pre 9-11, Borders were different. They'd go, all these guys with leather jackets and you're going to Disneyland? Yeah, yeah, we love it. And uh, we we wouldn't have our instruments with us because we'd ship them ahead and we'd kept some stuff down there. And we sleep on floors in Los Angeles and play gigs and met people and eventually got help there. We, we met publishers and managers and record label and got going in Los Angeles. Um, so that's how we, we did it. Uh, we didn't go to Seattle. We didn't, which was right across the border. We didn't go to any of those places. We just got, got on a plane and did a gig every few weeks to a, a month in Los Angeles. And that Gee. took, that took uh, about three years. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, um, and by the time we came out and had our album out and came back into Canada with our singles and stuff, a lot of people thought we were from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> you left Canada to play America and then you come back and you're like, oh, Australian band. Oh my gosh. We were, we, we had probably circled America in a van for months way before we played a gig in the rest of Canada outside really? of Vancouver. Oh Yeah. Well, now, actually, let me ask you this, because I learned this last year. I went to Alaska, and I drove. I'm, I live in western New York, about two hours from Niagara Falls, and I drove, uh, I drove over to Minnesota, the rest of the way drove through Canada, and somebody, a Canadian, had told me this. I never realized it. Not a lot of small towns in between, like, the cities. Like, there's a lot, there's a lot less in between. I mean, playing down here in the States, was there more to play in between? Because that's something I saw where it was like, in between cities here, you could still go play a gig in a place of 20,000 people or, you know, there's a there's a small town in between where what I learned from driving through there, sometimes those small towns in between just don't exist in Canada. I mean, is that a little easier to play or clown here and find different places? Uh, we thought it was. And um, it's easier in the winter to go to the south of America. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we, were, we were trying the endless summer thing, the Beach Boys idea, but um it yeah you're right in a lot of ways uh, in canada if you're a musician from vancouver there's this big the rockies in between you and the next major gig so you you drive for 12 hours to your next gig and uh if it's calgary and the in between towns they're they're big they're big enough they're they're like the small towns you talk about they're your sort of secondary markets there weren't too many gigs in them. So a lot of times you're driving huge distances on tour in Canada to get the same number of gigs. You're right. And in, um, in the States, if you say you lived in Philadelphia, a band, just in that spoke of cities around you, you, could, you, you don't even have to go any, anywhere else. You can, oh. go to New, you can go to New York, you can go to Baltimore, you can go to jersey you can go to you know boston wherever yeah no i mean that that is something i i never even thought it was not even didn't even enter my mind until driving through canada and then i thought of that i thought of touring bands and i go wow this seems like there's a lot less kind of in between besides but, but, but wait it costs just the same to drive all those distances it costs 
more to stay in hotels. So you get all the cost, but less opportunity. Less gigs. <laughs> but besides that, I mean, what are the, what would you say are kind of, and it's stuff like really, it really does interest me because again, like, even discovering some like Canadian art, there's things that I can't even like odds. Like I can't believe it took me as long as I did to discover you guys, but like, you know, the music industry in Canada versus America, and it does seem kind of different. I mean, besides that touring part, are there any really big differences or things that are just drastically like how it's ran here versus there? I mean, is there anything else that pops out in your head where it's like, they're like just two different monsters? Not really. Not really. I think you can play, all over the world and most of the mechanisms of doing a show are the same and people treat you well especially if they've invited you to come play for them um but uh probably the biggest obstacle is the way immigration works you know that it's a big border and our countries are best pals but the um the the policies are not forgiving and they're increasingly expensive. Right now, it's really difficult for Canadians to play music in, in the States. Really difficult. I'm not so sure it's as difficult for musicians from the US to play in Canada. So it's it's so staggeringly expensive to get visas um, that it's cost prohibitive for somebody who's not making something on the other end that's the right amount of money to cover all that stuff do you uh do you have, have you gotten down to the states much recently like more recent years do you get down and play here at all or do you not really get down here a whole lot i'm down there quite a lot with steven page so i'm a, a lot so he he lives in syracuse he's a canadian but uh he lives in syracuse new york and so uh and there's enough of a momentum in his career there's a lot more gigs in the states so i'm down there and so we've gone and done mashup shows with steve and the last time we were in the states with odds was uh down the west coast seattle portland and that that kind of stuff and i think some sporadic other gigs where where steven needs a full band and then we'll play our music too opening or we'll mash it up so that's that's been our only U.S. adventures lately. Other than that, we have to send it to you through the internet. We got to enjoy the the new music. We gotta we gotta yeah. listen to the recordings. Yeah, it's not, you know, I mean, obviously, like you said earlier, I mean, you, you guys played with bare naked ladies and all that back in the day. I mean, how did that? Obviously, it's how you met Stephen. You know, how did you kind of get? Because on top of doing that with the solo stuff, I know you do the Trans Canada Highway Men and all that with them. Like, yeah. how did that? How did the musical relationship kind of start when you started collaborating? That side, you know, after touring and all that together, where does the beginning of you guys collaborating musically start? Oh, yeah, that, well, that's an easy one to answer. When he left the band, he just phoned me and said, hey, <laughs> hey, we should probably, would you like to come out to my place and write some songs because I'm making a record? And I said, yeah, I'll be there in a day or two. And uh, I went out to Syracuse and stayed with he and his family and um, started writing. It was that simple. And a, a few of those, a couple of those songs, maybe three, were on page one, his debut. And then because of the way that went, we did his next one more together. Like we wrote a lot more together. And uh, and then I got involved in helping him produce the same way that he did for us later. I got involved in that. And I've had something to do with all of the records since um and then the two to the the two after that when a lot of the music was the bed tracks were some odds and all the other collaborators kevin fox who's part of the trio is a big part of all these records too so the stephen page trio came about was that i started writing with him Kevin was already playing with him as a duo. Kevin's the cellist and singer. And so they were traveling around guitar and cello. And then Steven said, well, we wrote these songs and I make, why don't you and I do some a little duo tour? So we did a couple of those. And then like the um, Reese's peanut butter cup, at one point he's realized, oh, I'm doing this. And 
he knew that Kevin and I were friends too. So uh, we started that band in um, when he got an offer to do two weeks at the Cafe Carlisle in New York, which is, uh, you know, the Bobby Short room. It's a Upper East Side famous uh, little, you know, the lamps on tables uh, cabaret. And um, we did two weeks there and we just put the two, three of us together and we figured it out really quickly. And I think that was 10 years ago. We're wow. still doing it. We're still doing it. <laughs> Is there, is there, and maybe it's hard to do, but like, I mean, obviously you collaborate very well. You, you mesh together very well. I mean, is there anything, you, maybe it's hard being the person who's part of it, but like, is there anything you think you and Steven do especially well or why it's like worked? So, I mean, that, it sounds like a great relationship there where it's like, why broke with, why, you know, it's not fixed. If it's not broken, why fix it? And it seems like, I mean, at this point you've been at it a while and it doesn't sound like you're stopping. I mean, is there anything you credit to why you two work so well together? I think we, we like a lot of my collaborations, Stevens intensely. So we laugh a lot, you know, we understand, we like a lot of the same things and the same things kind of make each, each of us laugh and odds is like that too. It's very similar. It's uh, we have a good time. We look forward to it. It's, there's not a lot of, tension and we uh we push each other too but in a really uh kind way <laughs> you know we uh there there's something to live up to when you're working with people you respect so there's always you got to raise the bar each time and that's good for each other and he's 10 years younger and is super enthusiastic about types of music that i may have overlooked completely because of because of where I was at in the context of where I was, I might have missed it. So sometimes I can go back in time to places that he's pointing to culturally and also um, musically and realize, oh, that was a really valid and awesome thing. And I really like it that I missed out on. So um, there's so many dimensions to that collaboration that work. And I have I'm lucky in my life to have had several people like that, that have brought something to, to my, uh, my world in the collaboration. I, I do, I made three albums with um, Rob Baker from the tragically hip called uh, our band is called strippers union. And that's a bunch of odds, a bunch of tragically hip players and, and Rob and I laughing in a room basically and punching up each other's jokes in the songs and him bringing a whole mass of music to me usually and me getting the total luxury of cherry picking through it and going that one i got an idea for that one and then we start and um uh jesse valenzuela from the gin blossoms we in that time i spoke of going to los angeles our bands were sharing the bills and sleeping on the same floors of a same friend and we've been friends forever we made an album in the beginning of the 2000s together and wrote a bunch of songs together and continued to do so same thing we just he brings something i learned so much about roots music and about so much stuff and we had our huge fan crush on nick lowe as something in common and um and colin james another sort of canadian rhythm and blues icon another guy i met uh early on in my life and same thing i made seven or eight albums with him i think that idea of collaboration is obviously something i like you know i like the, right alone i like the idea that not all the inspiration has to come from within or from your environment, but somebody can curate it for you for a second and say, I really like this idea. And even if you don't identify with the idea right away, if you give it a second, you'll find something in there. That makes it no, that, that I think collaborating with you for you works. It obviously, yeah. uh, it seems to work doing that. 
where like where like in there with Steven? I mean, like I said, you do the Trans Canada Highway Men. Where does that come into play? Where does where does that whole thing kind of start after you know you do the solo stuff with Steven? Where do you, when do you guys start doing that? Uh, we started doing that, I think, twenty. I'm bad with the numbers. About I'm going to say six years ago, uh, but we um, we had. Uh, Mo Berg, Pursuit of Happiness, Chris Murphy, Sloan, Stephen, and I have all been friends and connected over the years. Um, and we had a mutual friend. Uh, I, I work in, I don't know if this is something that you know, but sort of I work a lot in television and, and specifically in comedy and with um, the kids in the hall and um, there's a show in Canada called Corner Gas, Brent Butt. The I discovered event. you, actually. That's the yeah. Last year, I discovered Corner Gas, and I discovered mm -hmm. you at odds through that. Oh, oh, amazing. Well, I was going to get to that later, actually. I don't know oh. if you get I, – I assume you get asked a million Corner Gas questions. I was waiting for the end to ask it. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, we'll go there in a sec. That because um, So one, the, the director of the live show for Kids in the Hall is a guy named Jim Milan, who's – He's a really talented uh, stage director. And um, he was friends with Mo Berg. And they were talking one day about how he, that he had this idea of four guys in bands getting together to, to go on stage and do a stage production where they talked about being in bands. And they'd have to be people that Canadians knew. You know, I guess they didn't have to be just Canadians, but anywhere in the world. And um, so he said, can you think of anyone? And, and Mo said that he had been talking to Chris about doing something. And earlier, like maybe a couple years earlier, Chris, Murphy, and Stephen and I had talked about doing this. Uh, same kind of a thing of collaborating together, going, doing a sort of songwriter tour where we talk about things and play together and um so when mo said it to chris asked him about it what what should we do chris said well steven and <laughs> craig and i have been talking about this and we all knew we were all friends so we thought well that's kind of a band because chris can play drums and we can all play bass and guitar let's let's see if we can do this so we put together that show with with Jim as the director and it had a, a, a visual component and we got together a bunch of our archives and basically we just talked about what being in a band really is and, and the process and did these live shows where we played <clears throat> all the singles that we put out basically, maybe a couple deep cuts, but mostly just things that people were familiar with and we swapped instruments and, uh, the, so the the rest of the show fell away and we kept we kept keep doing that every once in a while so that's where that came from no and then you're still doing that right i, I think i saw you guys just played a show like a month or so ago so it's still like ongoing oh last week we played a show oh, last, yeah. Oh, last yeah. Week. <laughs> yeah we have a couple more coming up and yes i it's not announced yet but there will be an album so Ooh! Oh, I got. I, as I was telling you, I discovered uh, you and Odds and Corner Gas last year. Somehow, I discovered Sloan about a month ago, and that's all I've been listening to for like a month now. So, oh yeah, that's uh, a deep. That's a deep. Well, you're gonna enjoy that. Yeah. Oh my! I've hit like maybe three or four out. Like, I mean, I've listened all throughout the catalog, but I've only gone through like four full length albums. There's so much to go back through. There is, yeah. Uh, that's why they have that album. You'll never hear the end of this. It's a double album. <laughs> <laughs> no, very, very happy to uh, hear you guys will be uh, baking some music. I mean, obviously, all of you know what you're doing in the studio. I'm excited to hear that. But yeah, I mean, it's well, already made. It's already made. So. Oh, it's done. It's done. It's done, nice. and it's done, and it's ready to come out. Yeah. Oh, I, do you think you'll be? Uh, I assume you'll be doing some touring behind that. I don't know about the states, but you'll be doing some uh, at least some Canadian touring. That's what we hope for. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Well, I mean, just the, just a couple more here for you. I mean, like we were just talking about how, 
how did the whole corner gas thing kind of come about? Because that was, I, I discovered the show. I'm like, a great theme song. Go from there. Go down the rabbit hole with your music. You know, how did all of that kind of come about for you? I started in, uh, we made a friendship with the kids in the hall who most people know, whether it's from the kids in the hall or the other things the the people in the kids in the hall have done. Um, I started working with them after they collaborated with us on a video in one of our early albums because we found out we were mutually fans of each other. They loved our records, our first, our first record when it came out. And then we were, they were on TV and they were exciting and they were at the vanguard of comedy. So of course we were fans of theirs and, um, became friends. So in 1995, they asked me to do their first feature film called Brain Candy as the scoring composer. And of course, I lied and said, Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> and uh, that began my career as a in television or film, comedy, um, composition. And uh, so in Vancouver, I had a friend Brent Butt, who was a comedian and uh, we were drinking one night and he said, Hey, if I ever get a show picked up, would you do the music for it? And I said, yeah, of course. And then I don't know how many years later that was more than a decade. He phoned me and he said, do you remember that time you said that to me? And I said, uh, no, but I, I would, I would say it again today. And he goes, well, guess good news. I got a show. And then he said, let me describe it to you. And, uh, he described the show and the characters and everything to me on the phone. <clears throat> and he said, so could you write the theme song? And I said, yep, uh, I have an idea. So Jesse from the Gin Blossoms and I had written this tune a, a few days before. And I went and I said, is it okay if I adapt this to this show? And Jesse goes, go for it. So we, we finished it on the phone, Jesse and I, he lives, he lives in, at the time he lived in LA um, and uh, I, we adapted it on the phone and I thought, this is great. This is just, just perfect, but I should probably give Brent two options. So I wrote another one and uh, on my own and I sent them both to Brent and he says, that's great. We'll take both. We'll put one at the beginning and one at the end. <laughs> and that's, that's how it worked. Oh, nice. Very, so, very nice. So I didn't score the, I didn't do the underscore for the live action corner gas. And then I did do four seasons of underscore for the animated one. Oh, wow. Yeah. That, that whole world, like, I mean, I'm kind of interested in that. Like, is it, is it totally different doing mu you know, like music for film and, and television, all that? Is it totally different from just write like say like you know you're writing an odds album versus writing music for like Corner Gas or Kids in the Hall or something? I mean, are they totally different monsters? Are they pretty similar? You know, is one easier than the other? Like, I, I can't totally tell, but it does seem like there's more parameters probably on writing for film and television because obviously you know you're writing for something specific versus you're just writing a song out of thin air about whatever comes to mind. Yeah, I think the parameters are you're supporting someone else's inspiration for one the the picture and working with the director say as your collaborator so cut back to me talking about how i like collaborating i like working with the director on and most of the people i work with who are directing something have musical sense like they are musical and so they can describe what it is that they might imagine and then also leave it open for me and learning that a uh, sense of what helps a scene or doesn't when not to put music in what kind of music would work how to do it is something you develop it's a different it is a different skill um the the i and and the ideas of everything calls for something else especially since i work a lot in sketch comedy it might something they're all kind of small films, each sort of sketch or each area. So you're called on to do a lot of different types of music or so orchestral music or uh, anything, any genre of music. So 
there there's a lot of stretching for somebody who comes you know most musicians come from one place there's a lot of learning and stretching there too so i've really enjoyed it it's been great for me as a to develop as a musician and uh yeah i think the great thing about it is the inspiration is provided you right in front of you so when you're writing a song just like you said out of thin air you're going out in the world and you're hearing a conversation on a bus and you have to have your antenna on and pick up what the person said and go well, that's really interesting and it triggers your imagination and and becomes a song and you start singing it in your head with the melody and then you what chords go under that and so it develops from pulling something out of the ether but when you're doing it for film it's there how can you help it how can you support it and um and I'll, sometimes the you don't get it right the first time so there's a lot more rejection too i you know when you're presenting your music to somebody who's a gatekeeper as we talked about earlier to get your music out there they either like it or they don't so they reject it right away but there's a lot of in film i don't like it so maybe try this you can't give up you have to do it again <laughs> they go no i don't like that either try again so you have to do it again and again so you can't there's a lot of not taking it personally yeah no that that sounds like it that sounds like you got to go in there not taking that personally and you can't yeah. it's like you can scrap it either you can't go well i guess i'm just not gonna like do the song for this movie now you still yeah. gotta write it yeah or why don't you change your your picture yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah why don't you change your film to accommodate my music i think yeah. that's the problem here <laughs> i think only a couple of composers in history have ever pulled that one off <laughs> Well, I mean, there, there's obviously a lot going on in the world of Craig Northey. We got a new odds record. Um, is there anything else kind of going on for the uh, rest of 2023 you want to let people know about? Anything else we should uh, keep an eye out for for the rest of the year from you? Sure. You watch um, Stephen Page has a new record, Excelsior, which is brilliant. And so we're out working on that. And you can look at his website and see if I'm coming to town and come say hello. Uh, I'm usually with Steven and odds wise, there are going to be more now that we've done a few summer festivals and um, we'll keep hunting for places to play together. And um, there's going to be a video coming out for one of the songs that we released as a single. And like I said, the highwayman thing as yet, I'm not, I can't give away any more information, but something's coming. It's all done. And um, we'll try to play some shows. And Strippers Union, we've already been writing some more music for a follow-up to the last one, which was uh, um, a double album we put out during COVID. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> Smart. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, where do we, uh, where ought we send people now to find you? Where are you online? Where do we get the new odds record? Where, where is all that good stuff? Pl plug away. Tell people where to go now. Oh, okay, oddsmusic.com for odds. Uh, and please, there's vinyl there coming up. Sorry, it's taking a while because the, you know, there's a big backlog of people who want to create vinyl, and sometimes the factory promises you a date that it's available, but but it's all made and manufactured. And there's, if you really like the music, the best way to support us is to pick up something if you can. You can find us on a Bandcamp channel too, if you prefer to get your music that way. So I think this is our, I, I'm glad you found us, Anthony, at this late stage of the game. And this is the album you heard, because if you're a musician, and you feel like that's your best work, your latest work, that's where you want to be. And I feel like this is the best album we've ever made. So it is a great record. And it's a, I mean, I've, I've discovered odds, but this is my first front to back odds record and my first new one. And yeah, you did good. I can, I can Thank tell you. you it is a damn fine record. <laughs> Thank you. That feels good at this age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I can't wait for more. I will definitely, you know, I have my, I have my ear on what you're doing now. 
as we close this out, anything else to uh, let the people know before if you're listening to the radio show, we will uh, play a couple songs off the new record. So we'll get into some music here. If you're listening on, if you're on the podcast, go over to Bandcamp and grab the thing. Go buy the album. But uh, yeah. Any, anything else to tell people before we play some music here? I think we've talked a lot. <laughs> I'm sure people are just going, come on. Come on, let, let me go listen now. I could have watched two episodes of Corner Gas in the That's time. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you can wa- watch the new Kids in the Hall series, too. I, I did. I, uh, I I scored that with my uh, and my friends, the Shadowy Men on the Shadowy Planet, also contributed big time on that. Well, very nice. There Again, there's a lot to check out in the world of Craig Northey. And if you're like me, if you're an American who is not, does not, you you are, don't know what Sloan and Odds and Corner Gas and all these are, you got a lot of stuff to go check out now. We're going to yeah. play the newest, the newest stuff from Craig right now. Play a couple songs off Crash the Time Machine. I am Anthony Merchant talking to Craig Northey right here on the Power Chord Hour. <laughs> 